Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to this webinar on the offshore release of Fukushima Daiichi treated cooling water. Um, this webinar is organized um, by the radiation protection net, uh, platforms NERES uh, Alliance and share in the context, context of the sixth NERES uh, workshop. My name is uh, Joke Genens. I'm a PhD student at uh, the Belgian Nuclear Research Center, uh, SEKCEN, and also at the University of Leuven. Throughout my academic uh, career, I have visited and studied in Japan on multiple occasions. And um, during each, each visit, I've noticed that Fukushima, the Fukushima accident has touched and impacted um, many lives of individuals, families, and communities in the affected areas, but also far beyond. Um, related to uh, today's topic, I, for example, remember um, a conversation with my um, host mother in Nagoya, um, and I asked her about um, the consumer cooperatives. She always bought her food there, and I wanted to know why. And one of the reasons was that she really wanted to know where her food products come from, and especially the fish, as she, was, she re really refused to buy fish from Fukushima. Um, as she was afraid of the contaminated water. So this already hints at how complex the issue um, is that we will discuss today. Now with the approval of the offshore release of uh, water used to cool the damaged uh, uh, nuclear, um, the damaged reactors, uh, the concerns related to the Fukushima uh, nuclear accidents, accident resurface. So the water plant to be released has been treated to remove uh, radioactive, radioactive uh, materials and has been accumulating in on-site storage tanks for many years. The announced plans for offshore release not only bring to light the technical challenges, but also raise societal, ethical, economic and environmental concerns. This webinar will bring together those insights from different fields attesting to complexity um, of the issue we will uh, discuss today. So the webinar is structured in the following way. First, we have six presentations. Each presentation will take 10 minutes, it will be followed by five minutes Q&A. Afterwards, um, we will um, have a 20 minute discussion. And at the end of the webinar, um, Hildegarde van den Hove, the MENAS president, will close uh, this meeting and give her also some final uh, reflections. So as an audience, you are all invited um, to give your opinion, give your uh, reflection, give your um, questions throughout the webinar via using the chat function um, of Zoom, which you can find at the bottom of the uh, screen. And Dr. Uh, Tanya Perko will moderate uh, the chat. Please note that the webinar is uh, being recorded and you will be able to find the recordings at the SHARE and NERIS um, websites. So now I will give the floor to the first speaker, who is uh, Christophe Siri. He is the Director of Nuclear Fuel Cycle, Waste Technology and Research Reactors at the International Atomic Energy Agency. So he has pre-recorded his um, presentation and I will now share it. But I am still with you today. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. I am very happy to address you this morning, both as director in the International Atomic Energy Agency for Nuclear Fuel Cycle, Waste Technology, Decommissioning and Research Reactors, but also as the leader of the team of the uh, international review of Fukushima decommissioning that I led in 2018 and in 2021. Just to start off what we're talking about, my first visit to the site was in 2012 when I was working in Japan for the French embassy. And what I saw was a site in a very, very difficult conditions, huge damage, hotspots everywhere, and at the same time, people working hard in a very difficult situation, supported by their families and their friends who sent them those trains. Now, from the beginning, government of Japan uh, was uh, looking for international involvement and he asked the IEA to organize international peer reviews of the decommissioning roadmap. 
they were looking for independent reviews of the activities related to what was going on inside the plant. The ag agency did other works related to off-site, but that was a very specific mechanism for what for the decommissioning itself, both to explain what they were doing, provide from the international review team advice and comment on safety and technical aspects, waste management and other related activities, provide advice also on planning and implementation, and facilitate sharing of good practices and lessons learned with the international community. And I want to stress that all those reports are available to the public, everyone, including you, on Japan and on uh, IAEA websites. So we completed the following reviews, 13, 15. I led the one in 2018 with a follow-up more focused on water on 2020, and the last fifth mission in summer 2021. What we saw, what I saw, and what we saw over time is that the site was improving a lot, but water accumulation is a problem. That was a major recommendation of the fourth mission and, uh, to find a solution for the disposition of this water. Japanese government, of course, was working on that. On one hand, on reducing the ingress of water uh, coming every, year, every day, but also on what could be the solutions to do that and they had several uh, actions one of them was to convene a subcommittee of uh, uh, experts but not only experts also including uh, uh, local stakeholders uh, uh, and so on to estimate assess what the solution could be so this report was issued this subcommittee report was issued in 2020 and we were asked by METI to review the progress made in water management and the ARP subcommittee report as a follow-up to one of our major recommendations at the previous review mission. We did that again with a group of international experts and our main conclusion were as follows. The water issues are well managed and we could see a significant reduction of ingress flow of water. The recommendation made by this ARP subcommittee are based on a sufficiently comprehensive analysis and on a sound scientific and technical basis. The objective of completing the disposition of treated water by the end of decommissioning work is aligned with current international good practice. You don't want to leave any water as a legacy to the next ones. And the two options that the subcommittee was proposing, paper release and the control discharge in the sea, are technically feasible and they are in fact routinely used in, uh, in nearly all nuclear power plants in the world. We then moved to the fifth review mission uh, uh, last summer, which was conducted with 12 national experts and which again review the full scope of the roadmap. So no specific focus on the water this, uh, this year for this review. We did it uh, with a combination of a long series of web meetings and a, a site visit because it's still important to see things and we handed over the report to Japanese and Vice Minister of METI at that time. Our main uh, conclusions, significant progress made since 2018, both organizational risk reduction technologies, but also looking to the future, we advise to strengthen the planning up to the end of the decommissioning for the whole site and to speed, uh, step up research and technology development for fuel debris management, this METIC call. So basically the timeline, as we can see it, that spent removal, which is a major risk reduction, is ongoing. Abstracted water discharge will start in the coming years, and fuel debris retrieval will be uh, coming later, and it's the remaining most important challenge for the decommissioning. Now, coming to the water management, the water management has been addressed at top level dialogue. And uh, one of the first visits of our director general after being appointed was to go to Fukushima. And he made clear that it's up to the government of Japan to decide how to proceed. And also that once a decision is taken, the IA would be ready to assist. That's what happened uh, uh, this year. 
So the government of Japan made the decision and they, uh, in September, a visit of senior management of the safety department went to Japan, confirmed that the agency's assistance to Japan will consist of reviews and monitoring to help confirm that the operation to discharge the water over the coming decades is consistent with international safety standards. This review or reviews will be based in particular on materials submitted by Japan and also on on-site technical missions to Japan, to the site. A task force has been established to review the uh, safety of a planned release of uh, water, including 11 international recognized experts with diverse backgrounds. And they are coming also from different countries, Argentina, Australia, Canada, China, France, the Marshall Islands, the Republic of Korea, Russian Federation, United Kingdom, United States, and Vietnam. I want to stress here that the agency is neutral and that it was important that this work is benefiting or is supporting at the same time Japan, but also all other countries which have a concern. That's why we decided to involve as many experts from as many countries as possible. And quoting our director general, I wanted to make sure that the agency would not only have the expertise of the best and brightest, but also the expertise of those from countries in the region. I thank you for your attention and will be happy to answer any questions. Hey, thank you, Christoph, uh, for your presentation. Um, so I don't know whether there are questions. There are at the moment no questions yet from the audience, but I do invite the audience to um, to uh, yeah raise any questions or comments. So I have uh, a question for you. Yes. Um, so what do you identify as the main challenge uh, for the IAEA related to the plant's uh, water release? I don't really think there are challenges from the agency. The agency is neutral and technical. So basically, and, uh, it's our uh, guiding principle of everything we do. We remain on the technical uh, uh, fact-based uh, uh, approach and uh, uh, be neutral, which is why, as I mentioned, uh, uh, having this task force is uh, not to help one country or another country, is to provide a, a neutral space uh, where everybody could, uh, could benefit and, uh, and, and be involved. This neutrality is important for us because we are a United Nations organization with 173 member states, and uh, uh, we should be the same way with everyone. Okay, thank you. Um, so since we have no other questions, um, maybe they will pop up uh, during the webinar. Um, but then I suggest we move on to the next uh, speaker. Thank you, Christoph. Um, so the next speaker is uh, Tanabe Yuki. Tanabe Yuki uh, works at the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry in the area of international, international trade and um, public relations. And she is now in charge of international aspects related to the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station, including the uh, cooperation with the IAEA. Yuki, the floor is yours. Um, I'm sorry, I cannot um, hear you. Um, still not hear me? Yes, yeah. Oh, okay, okay uh, I will. Ah, can you see my slides still? Yes. Um, could you maybe oh, so put, put it them in, in the presentation? Mm -hmm. ah, sorry. Uh, join me. Um, present. I, I'm trying to make it presentation mode. Is it okay? Um, anyway, I think I'll start. Uh, the bottom right of your screen it looks like a small uh, oh, screen. Oh, it's this small. Okay. Bottom right near the magnifying it. Um, so on the bottom um, of your screen, or you can. Um, it's. I think it's. If you... Stani te, 
Kitani te, you, you go down, yeah. okay. down, 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 right, down. right, 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 and down. Oh, ah, yes. Next one. Next one. Next one. Next one. Next to the right. Yes, this one. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, my name is Yuki Tanabe. I'm working for the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry for 20 years. And I was assigned to this position from this July. Today, I'd like to explain the background and brief overview of the basic policy on handling of the Alpos treated water, which was announced uh, by the Japanese government this April. Okay, oops, how can I go to the next slide? Mm -mm -mm. Okay, so the first slide shows the difference between contaminated water and the Alpus treated water. Contaminated water contains a large amount of radioactive materials and have been generated in buildings every day since the accident. Alpus treated water is the water in which most radionuclei are removed by Alps. Uh, which is a uh, multi nucleus removal equi equipment advanced liquid processing system to meet the regulatory standards for discharge with an exception of tritium. Tritium cannot be removed by purification and remains in the treated water at the level higher than its regulatory standards for discharge. And this is going to be diluted more than by, uh, 100 times before the discharge. And uh, let's move on to the next slide. This slide is about uh, the water stored in tanks. About 30% is Alpus treated water, which means concentration of radionuclides other than tritium meets the regulatory standards for discharge. About 70% is the water which contains radionuclides exceeds the regulatory standards, and it will be repurified to meet the regulatory standards with an um, exception of tritium. The next slide shows the results of repurification performance test. Last year, TEPCO, uh, the Tokyo Electric Power Company Holdings, analyzed 62 nuclides, which are subject to the removal and carbon-14. And for water contains uh, multiple nuclides, the regulatory standards for discharge is the sum of the ratio must be less than one. And after repurification, the sum of the ratio of concentration of the water with high concentration became 0 0.35, which is less than one, the regulatory standard for discharge. Uh, the, this slide is about the background of the basic policy. Um, systematic decommissioning efforts are essential for reconstruction and revitalization of affected areas. And in order to achieve both decommissioning and reconstruction, handling of the Alpus treated water had been examined. And for decommissioning, large areas are needed for fuel debris retrieval. The current situation where the tanks and piping pass facilities occupy increasingly large areas of the site can be a critical bottleneck in future decommissioning work unless their placement is reviewed. It has been pointed out that the existence of the tanks themselves is a cause of the adverse impacts on reputation and that the risk associated with deterioration or disaster may increase. This is the background of the basic policy announcement. The next slide shows the decommissioning work of TEPCO Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station. Fukushima Daiichi decommissioning is a continuous risk reduction activity to protect the people in the environment from the risks associated with radioactive substances by removing spent fuel and fuel debris from the reactor building and reducing the risk associated with contaminated water and radioactive waste. Safe and steady decommissioning is a prerequisite for reconstruction of Fukushima. 
slide six shows the current situation of the treated water. At Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station, there are more than 1,000 tanks now. The tank capacity is about 1.37 million cubic meters, uh, whereas tank storage volume as of September this year is about 1.28 million cubic meters, which is about 95% of tank capacity. The next slide shows the site layout of Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station. There is a large tank area on the right-hand side. A variety of facilities are needed to be built for decommissioning work, such as temporary storage facilities for spent fuel and fuel debris, and analytical facilities for various samples. Let's move back to the background of uh, the basic policy. As uh, Mr. Guzeri uh, explained in his presentation, for more than six years, the handling of the water has been studied by experts. The report was published in February 2020, and five options were examined, and it was stated that discharge into the sea was a more reliable method of implementation. And IAEA also reviewed this report in April 2020. Uh, the IAEA acknowledged that the option suggested by the committee is based on a sound scientific and technical basis of analysis. And after publication of the subcommittee's report, hundreds of meetings were held with local municipalities and relevant people in agriculture, forestry and fishery industry and various other parties concerned. Seven meetings for hearing opinions were held with the attendance of vice ministers of related ministries. And more than 4,000 opinions have been received. Based on this ALPUS subcommittee report and diverse opinions the government has received, the government of Japan uh, set the basic policy on handling of ALPUS treated water in April this year. In the basic policy, it is stated that the government selects discharge into the sea based on achieving certain and consistent compliance with the regulatory standards set forth based on the recommendations of the ICLP and considering the successful precedent in Japan, as well as conducting secure and sound monitoring. And the IAEA acknowledged that the option is routinely used by operating nuclear power plants and fuel cycle facilities in Japan and worldwide and technically feasible. Uh, okay, I'll skip the <laughs> chart. And uh, here is the chart which shows the process until the discharge. Subject to the approval of the Independent Nuclear Regulation Authority, NRA, in Japan, TEPCO can start the discharge into the sea, which is envisaged to take place approximately after two years. The basic policy also refers to a method of discharge that minimizes adverse impacts on reputation. The government of Japan will never approve discharge unless it meets regulatory standards <clears throat> regarding tritium uh, by diluting at least um, more than 100 times. Concentration of tritium will be less than 1,500 peclel per liter, which is one fortieth of the re regulatory standard and one seventh of WHO drinking water guideline level and annual amount of discharge will be less than 22 trillion becquerel per year. This is the number, um, with, uh, this number was the operational target before the accident. And radioactive material other than tritium will be repurified to below the regulatory standards for discharge and sufficiently diluted. Basic policy also states that the government of Japan and TEPCO will strengthen and enhance uh, sea area monitoring before and after the discharge, having participation and observation by 
agriculture, forestry, fisheries, local municipalities, and other business. IAEA also conducts marine monitoring. Uh, we can see the results in the IAEA website and the NLA website too. And basic policy also states about the uh, impact assessment on the environment. Uh, now TEPICO is conducting the assessment and it will be published when it is ready. And uh, this is the last slide which I am going to explain. Uh, the results of the radiation impact assessment uh, using the method of UNSCARE showed that the radiation impact is less than one over 100,000th of the natural radiation exposure, uh, which is 2.1 millisieverts per year in Japan. Uh, for the time uh, limit, I will skip the following slides. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Tanabe-san, uh, for your presentation, giving us an overview um, of yeah, the current situation, but also uh, future plans. So we have received a couple of um, uh, questions, and questions are actually still coming in. So um, Tanabe-san, um, your first question is, um, progress has been made, and release um, will be consistent with international safety standards. But do you consider the release limits should be the same as permitted for normal operations of the Fukushima nuclear power plant? Yeah, I think uh, any discharge must be in line with the uh, international standards and it must meet the regulatory standards. And the level, uh, mm, I think it's subject to the NRA approval, but uh, as long as uh, it meets the regulatory standards and uh, uh, and NRA's approval, uh, I think it is, uh, um, if it um, meets the regulatory standards, I think TEPCO can release the water, but at the same time, we have to make efforts to gain understanding from stakeholders so I think we need to communicate with scientific data. Yeah, and we need to make such, um, continue to make such efforts. Thank you very much. Um, second question um, that we, we've uh, received from the audience is, why has the per percent of Alps treated water that needs additional purification, which is around 70%, not, not changed since 2018, when this was first announced on the public websites? Uh, if I understand the question correctly, uh, the question is about why 70% uh, of the Alpus treated water needs repurification. I had uh, just after the uh, accident, I heard TEPCO uh, prioritize to make as much um, much mm, more water to be purified in uh, high speed. So they uh, mm, uh, so they try to mm, how do you say <laughs> uh, now uh, just after the accident. Uh, they need uh, they need to purify a lot of water. Uh, in short term, so uh, I think some uh, about some water needs to be repurified, and uh, now we have some uh, time after the the accident, so we now can <clears throat> purify more. How do you say properly using Alpus treated uh, Alpus? Yeah, it's I think um, yeah Alpus system can purify water below the level of uh, regulatory standard, but I had in the earlier stage, they need to speed up the uh, process. So some water needs to be repurification. Okay, thank you. I think we will um, also address um, this topic later in, in another mm -hmm. presentation. Um, I would like to ask one more question. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent do the Japanese population trust TEPCO to be responsible for the dis uh, discharge process? 
where other um, companies consider to lead this. Uh, so uh, yeah, typical uh, has um, the responsibility to conduct this judge uh, in line with the regulatory standards, safety standards, and everything. But typical is uh, cooperating with a lot of company, other companies, including international companies. Yeah. Thank you for your yeah for answer, answering the questions. Um, we yeah I see it. there are other questions. Uh, we will pick up on them uh, later on in the discussion. Um, but let's move on um, to the next presentation. Can I ask uh, Tanabe-san to stop uh, sharing okay. your screen? Um, so the next um, presenter today is Jordi Vives Ibadwe. Um, he's a marine radio ecologist working at the Belgian Nuclear Research Center, S uh, SCKC. And Jordi, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, first of all, a quick test. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And can you see something? <laughs> yes, we can see. Okay. I shall start my watch. Good morning, everybody. And thank you so much for inviting me to this interesting seminar. Uh, I'm going to talk to, about this issue today from the point of view of radioecology and impact assessment. I would like to start with a small preamble that, uh, as we all know, that's where here Japan announced that it would release uh, over a million tons of treated water contaminated by the Fukushima accident, which has tritium, but it also has trace elements of other radionuclides, which is one of the points I'll make. The IAEA is supervising this internationally, and the Japan appears to be aligned with the international safety standards. We know that. And uh, the, the information about how these releases will happen, what flows, what uh, mounts, what this is not available yet. But I've tried to make a preliminary screening assessment for not only humans, but also the, the non-human biota, the environment. And I will explain that the potential radiological impact appears to be rather limited based on the current information. And I will highlight the assumptions and I give uh, information about some future suggestions for future investigation. So uh, the contaminated water uh, uh, combines recovered groundwater and cooling water that was used to, to treat the, the reactor cores treated by the Alps purification system, like, uh, like Yuki Tanabe explained, they were uh, by the end of 2020, some thousand tons with about 1 million cubic meters of uh, water. Uh, the, but the capacity is being exceeded. There is a serious capacity problem and they have to consider releasing this material. That is quite understandable. And the water contains also small amounts of other radionuclides, but the Alps tree system is de designed to remove with high efficiency of those and the tritium cannot be removed because it passes through. So decision was made to discharge and uh, or is being made to discharge. Uh, other options have been considered like atmospheric, et cetera, but water seems to, to see seems to be the most, uh, the most uh, viable. Tritium is the main component, uh, which is, of course, as we know, a radioactive form of hydrogen, which has the lowest dose coefficients amongst radioactive isotopes. And this is being routinely dis discharged to, to water all around the world, most notoriously in the case of Sellafield in the UK and Kaplahag in France, just to frame this into a bit of a context. And it's considered not to be health risk at stipulated limits, given the dilution factor of the ocean. But as I said, we have no further information about exactly how this is just because they aren't ready yet to, to do this. It will happen in the next few years, but the water will be repurified, diluted to below standards uh, of WHO, etc. This is all well explained in the information that METI and TEPCO have published on their, on their websites. And there is a study underway. Uh, the Alps subcommittee has made a study to assess the radiation exposures, which is not published yet, as it's been mentioned based on the methodology, the on care for uh, public exposures due to radioactive discharges, an assessment for humans they have uh, re they released, and although it's not published officially, it's already online uh, information, and they estimate doses to the public very low, as, uh, as Yuki Tanabe has explained, so I won't repeat it. And I, I'm, I'm atmospheric release is possible, but most of the radioactivity would go over the ocean anyway, and it would not be so controlled as released the water. But they didn't report yet doses to non-human biota, which is what I will, uh, one of the things I will show here. 
So I did an initial radiological impact assessment out of interest uh, on this topic because I've been researching Fukushima uh, impact uh, to the environment for, for since the beginning, having been in the original on scare assessment, etc. And I made a preliminary screening assessment, assuming a very, uh, a very um, brutal assumption that all the radionuclides, they will be the, all the radioactivity will be discharged at a rate equivalent to the existing amount stored every year which is unrealistic because it will be released more slowly. But anyway, METI assumed that to, to give a high limit to the dose. Assuming no undergoing on additional treatment, which also is, is very pessimistic because the, the water will be treated, and assuming that all the fish consumed is from the local compartment instead of wider regional waters, which in my case is even more conservative than what METI has done. And what did I do? I took the data for more than 200 tanks from TEPCO 2021 online. And I averaged this. Uh, and I looked at the ratio of average concentrations of non-tritium radionuclides to tritium to use a scaling factor to be able to get uh, um, a hypothetical mathematically generated discharge. I defined the assessment zone as the same that the, as adopted in the on-scare local compartment 10 by 10 by 10 kilometers. I model the activities in water and sediment using not the on-scare uh, compartment model as METI did, but the IAEA SRS-19 marine model, uh, which is basically making an average, vertically average solution of the adversion dispersion equation. The assessment to non-human biota I used the ERICA tool. Uh, for the those uh, for the uh, humans, I used the ICRP um, uh, approach with the RCRP 72 uh, using committed effective dose and uh, uh, per unit ingestion and the external doses by Eckerman and Ryman. All of this is very much bog standard. And uh, my initial results are that the model treating concentration is 80 becquerels per liter of water in that area which is far lower than the WHO drinking water guideline, that even at 100 meters from the release point, the activity uh, of tritium in water would be lower than the guideline, that for non-human biota, all those rates are below the lower boundaries of the ICRP derived consideration reference level ones for non-human biota, below which effects are not expected. And I concluded that doses are no, of no great significance to population of flora and fauna for this hypothetical release. Uh, for humans, I obtained the total internal ingestion dose of 18 micro sievers per year for the group of Japanese consumers, of which tritium contributes only 0.04, because, of course, tritium has the lowest dose factors, as we know. And the total external dose for exposures to beaches will be 2.6 micro sievers per year. For this, I have a paper submitted in IEAM now a small commentary paper. So the radiological significance of these plant discharges is, is, is quite low compared with the annual exposure in Japan arising from background and other sources. And I also made a calculation that to reach an exposure equal to the, uh, this annual dose of 2.1 millisieverts per year, the average Japanese would have to eat two and a half, 2,500 kilos of fish, 170 kilos of crustacean, and 230 kilos of mollusks. Uh, per year, which would be a hundred times what their normal diet is, which would not be a very digestible sort of activity to do in the first place. But um, this is not to say that the case is for dismissal in terms of a scientific interest, because there are uncertainties in, in all the calculations. For example, we don't know the final state in which the water tank effluence will reach in terms of purification or dilution, because it's not being done yet. Uh, in, the, in, the, in that sense, my calculations and the ones of my idea are, are to be considered an upper bound level, assuming, uh, uh, assuming some pessimistic assumptions. There is uncertainties in the boundary of the fishing area, and there are some, a lot of less than values in the tanks measurements because there is, uh, there are some cases their, their radioactivity didn't reach the limit of detection of the instruments they use. And it also, these models that we are using for, say, water dispersion and sediment uptake assume an equilibrium partitioning with the sediment and water in an equilibrium. And this is a, a reasonable, for reasonable for continuous releases, but not exact. So this is the main messages. And I, what advice would I give in my, in my remaining two minutes for the future? 
Uh, first of all, I would advise uh, communicate to the international scientific community the expected isotopic composition of the water foreseen after the final treatment and the release sequence, the regime they will use, how many of what the flow will be, because then we can carry out independent supportive assessments for this uh, in, in the sense that uh, it will be more, more, more clear then and it will be more better model. Uh, the scientific uh, community, the radiologists, the marine scientists should make an assessment of the long-term fate and impact of radionuclides in the ocean, focusing on mechanisms in sediments and biota using advanced models of adversion, dispersion of sediment mixing, like the ones that Japanese uh, colleagues and other colleagues in the US and other countries have developed for studying Fukushima in general. Uh, it is my opinion that it would be good to conduct independent scientific monitoring. And this should be not only tritium, but also the other uh, radionuclides to verify the fate and transfer radio elements and that there are no unexpected emerging behaviors like local accumulations and things like this. From the plant release, uh, this should be framed in the global context of authorized releases because, um, I mean, we're talking about, about uh, less than a thousand terabekers of tritium when the French La Hague released 11,900 terabekers of tritium in 2017 and, you know, and, and, and Sellafield has the discharges of the order of, uh, of higher order as well. So this has to be understood in order to reassure European people what is the significance of this in context of other tritiums that are being released. Um, and of course, to me, low doses does not mean no concern because uh, there are uh, local, fishy, fish, local fishers who are working in rebuilding fisheries after the, the Fukushima accident. And as it was mentioned in the first presentation, from the consumer point of view, uh, there are people that are worried and people need to be reassured. And I, I always support that people be given re, re good information. Uh, this picture here shows one attempt to simplify the problem too much. People are intelligent. Uh, a lot of people can understand uh, uh, good science when it's presented clearly to them. But especially um, in this case, I recommend it. And for the scientists to explain the uncertainties as well, so that this is, gives the public more confidence in what studies are being done. And these are my messages. Uh, and I thank you very much for all your attention. And I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Juri, uh, for this insightful presentation, also for expanding a bit um, and, and picking up on some topics that will be addressed in the following uh, presentations. But first, um, there is a question from you. <clears throat> sorry. Um, so H2O, sorry, <clears throat> is a beta uh, radiator and thus external doses should be far lower than internal. So why is external dose so high? Um... Well, uh, first of all, uh, I considered uh, not tritium only, my doses include all the radionuclides. Uh, and there is external dose, I think it's cobalt 60, if I'm not mistaken, that is the one that gives the ex highest external dose because it's a gamma emitter and, uh, and you are standing on top of the sediment and that gives, these are very low doses, eh? but of course the tritium is a beta emitter and it will give a minuscule part of that dose. And I, I didn't have time to explain this. Um, of course, but uh, indeed that the, the, the question asked was correct in that sense. Uh, uh, the losses for, from the impurities are higher than from, from tritium, but they are still very low compared with the, those levels that are considered to be uh, of reference like the, uh, and in the case of external exposure, it will be the gamma emitters that will dominate. Then there is also a follow-up question. Um, H2, H2O is not accumulating in the aquatic food chain. Is it sufficient um, to use simply concentration in water to get the contamination in fish? Like an excellent question, uh, whoever asked this. Uh, of course, uh, there is the organically bound tritium may be a, a slightly different in terms of bioaccumulation factors. And this is why I recommended that studies should be made, uh, particularly including biokinetic modeling and to model the HTO and also the OVT. Just basically, I don't expect this to create uh, a problem, but it, it's important to 
to prove to people that things are uh, that the impacts are, are 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 indeed low. And this is why I say that the scientific community, which I consider a stakeholder in the in this process, not just uh, um, witnesses, but a real stakeholder, should participate in doing this kind of biokinetic modeling studies to prove the point with STO, with OBT, and with all the other things uh, in the environment. And that's why studying the non-human biota is very important. Now, taking up on uh, the scientific um, scientific community, you, you advise uh, independent scientific monitoring mm. of uh, non-tritium radionuclides in ocean, marine biota and sediments. Yes. But what do you consider or what agencies do you consider as independent? From my opinion as a researcher, I always think about the scientific community as such, not as an, not agencies. I mean, the agencies, we already have the AIAA, which is, who is independent, in my opinion, and is doing a good job in advising Japan on this. But what I was talking about is, uh, and that's why the Japanese have done so well to, to get the AIAA on their side. But what I'm talking about is the scientists as a stakeholder group, they are up to act as a group. And I'm talking about people in research institutes and also in, in a superstructure provided by uh, organizations such as the Radio Ecology Alliance, for example, where there is a marine, uh, marine group that is studying problems in the marine environment around the world. And this is the kind of activities that I would like to see from the research institutes and universities, scientists grouping on their umbrellas, so just these platforms and to develop uh, projects that would aim at following this up from the scientific perspective. Because even if the doses are low, uh, will be low, likely to be low, you still have to demonstrate protection and you still have to understand the mechanisms and you still have to um, study the uncertainties and communicate all this in order for the whole process to be complete. So I see a big role for things like the Radio Ecology Alliance and also internationally with the research institutes and national labs around the world. Thank you for your answer. Um, I see there are other questions, but um, unfortunately we have to uh, move on to the next speaker, uh, who is um, Thierry Schneider. He is a member of the Nuclear Protection Evaluation Center in France, and today he uh, represents um, the International Commission on Radiological Protection. Thank you. Thank you. So I will first share, share my screen. Uh, is it okay for, for the screen? Yeah? Yes. Okay. So thank you. Thank you for this invitation. Uh, and this is my, my pleasure to be here today uh, with uh, the Neris Share and Alliance uh, webinar, where I, I was uh, very largely involved, uh, as some of you may know, uh, notably with uh, chairing the Neris platform till, the, uh, and, until June uh, this year. But uh, today uh, I will. Uh, present my, uh, the view of ICRP as a new chair of uh, ICRP Committee 4. In fact, uh, first of all, I, I would like, uh, sorry, I would like to mention, excuse me, uh, yeah, I would like to mention that uh, ICRP, with regard to this uh, issue of uh, recovery and uh, notably appreciated water, was not directly involved in this topic, but I, I would like to, to share with you uh, some few elements on how the radiation protection system uh, and the principle for the radiation protection system should apply in such situation and what we can uh, learn from uh, the experience since the, the Fukushima accident in, in 2011. So following the Fukushima accident, ICRP has first uh, organized uh, some discussion with uh, the member of uh, the Japanese uh, member of ICRP uh, to organize the ICRP Fukushima Dialogue Initiative starting in fall 2011 with regular focus on remediation and the living condition in affected areas. And that was uh, the opportunity for uh, ICRP and uh, uh, different stakeholders to exchange regularly and to see how far this, the, the application of the system uh, could be uh, of uh, help uh, to, to address uh, the challenge associated with the post-accident situation. For, following uh, this first initiative, uh, I think it was in 20, uh, 
12 or 2013, uh, ICRP set up a task group to start to revise, uh, to update the previous publication on emergency and recovery. And uh, the last, uh, the, the initial uh, publication on emergency and recovery was published in 2009. Uh, and then the last publication was just uh, issued uh, last year, uh, last December, uh, and now you can see on publication 146. So I will rely on, on this element to, to share with you some elements. Uh, before uh, before to go in more detail with this element, I would like to emphasize that ICRP did not and does not intend to give specific statement on this issue of uh, offshore releases, which in fact remain a decision to be taken by Japanese stakeholders. So my uh, intention today is mainly to share with you in what what in the current recommendation and recovery process could apply to evaluate the situation and also to share with you some elements which are still going on with uh, the Fukushima uh, dialogue initiative which are now a day uh, on the on the end of uh, the local stakeholders really uh, i can't okay Sorry, I had a problem to move to the next slide. So first of all, the objective uh, and principle of radiological protection for recovery, uh, the main uh, objective is to mitigate radiological consequences, both for people and the environment. Uh, and we have seen with the, present, current, uh, pre the previous presentation that this is clearly something at stake. And it's interesting to notice that within this objective, ICRP emphasized ensuring sustainable living condition for the affected people, suitable working condition mainly for responders, but also maintaining the quality of the environment. So this is a general statement. Then we have to see how in practice it could be done. The first uh, principle is justification uh, of protective decision. This justification is not a one of process, but should be regularly assessed as the radiological situation evolves. And the question which is at stake today with the triciated water is clearly in this perspective. There is a need to involve key stakeholders in public consultation process. And we have seen, sorry, we have seen with a, a presentation from our Japanese colleagues that already a large number of meetings have been organized but this is still uh, something which is at stake. The justification of protective action, uh, in fact, it's aimed at improving what we call the well-being of individual and the quality of life. And once again, to take into account the preservation of the quality of the environment for the future generation. So this is clearly what is mentioned in the publication 146, and which is quite uh, echo with some of the elements which have been already presented. For the optimization of protection, the, the objective is that all individual exposure should be kept as low as reasonably achievable. Taking into account, this is clearly mentioned in publication 146, not only societal and economic factors, but also environmental factors. And this is clearly one challenge for ICRP to better address this aspect. Optimization should be consider, should consider the radiological and environmental characteristic of the exposure situation. And then we, we, we have seen previously that the scientific aspect has to be, of course, uh, at the core of the assessment, but it's also needed to reflect the views and concern of stakeholders and also to consider ethical values that govern radiological protection. And I know that uh, Deborah Rutan will come back on, on this aspect. With regard to the, the, the ethical aspect, uh, what is mentioned is that the objective is to avoid unnecessary exposure, which refer to prudence, fair distribution of exposure among the exposed individuals, which mainly refer to justice, and treating people with respect which refer to the value of dignity as uh, already uh, published in uh, publication 138 of, of ICRP. So the optimization process is inevitably uh, a, a, comp a, a, complex, uh, to, to a complex system, uh, but then there is a need to cope with various conflict of interest among stakeholders. Uh, and we, we have already uh, seen in the previous presentations that this is 
something to be uh, clearly considered in, in this situation. Then with regard to, I will briefly emphasize what is uh, the aspect for public, uh, for protection of the public in the long-term phase. This protection of the public rely on the set of protective actions that continue and complement the action implemented during the early and intermediate phase. So I will not go too much in detail. There is a need to adopt some reference level. And if you check the recommendation from the commission with regard to post-accident situation and the long-term phase, the objective is to select the reference levels in the lower half of the one to 20 per year bound with the objective to progressively reduce exposure to level towards the lower end of the band, which means one millisievert or, or below if possible. If you refer to the previous presentation by Jordi, you see that with regard to triciated water, we are not in this order of exposure. And then of course, there is a need to further consider what is uh, the use of reference level in this situation and how to optimize even below one millisievert. So, and of course, it is also recommended that stakeholders confronted with a situation should be involved as much as possible in this perspective. Then there is a consideration on the environment. Of course, as you may know, fauna and flora should be protected using the ICRP framework. This is based on uh, reference animals and plants. And uh, there is a, the, 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 the use of uh, the derived consideration reference level, DCRLs. Uh, and the objective is to see uh, if we, uh, if the, 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 the contamination or the pollution of the environment or the presence of radionuclide in the environment may affect uh, this uh, plant and uh, animal. In fact, <clears throat> If we check what is currently in, in, in the triciated water, we are far below this DCRL. Uh, but then uh, there is a need, as mentioned in, in this uh, document, in, in publication 146, that protective action should be considered within an overall approach, uh, including the abundance and diversity of triconid and undamaged species, the spatial extent of the impact, and the inherent value of the environment. So what is behind this inherent value of the environment? This is something which is quite uh, challenging. And of course, <clears throat> with regard to the intermediate and long-term phase, the commission recommends that consideration should be given to reduce exposure, in particularly exposed wraps, taking into account societal, environmental, and economic factors. And we have seen that there is a, a pressure on uh, the market uh, for uh, associated with uh, fishermen. So I will not go too much in detail according to the time schedule. Uh, the co-expertise process, uh, which uh, really recommend adopting uh, the involvement of stakeholders uh, in different steps. First of all, to establish dialogue, then to organize some measurement. And of course, <laughs> probably for uh, triciated water, it's not so simple to, to organize that, but then there is a, a need to, to articulate and to cooperate with uh, different experts and including uh, independent experts, as it was mentioned previously. And then of course, one of the key points is to be able to organize the vigilance for the long term. So the consideration uh, of the co-expertise process is that responsible organizations should promote the involvement of local communities. There is a need to restore and preserve the human dignity. Uh, there is a need to engage dialogue and measurement uh, to help uh, people to, have a, uh, to, to, to better uh, understand what is at stake and to identify their key concern. And of course, there is a need to take time. It requires, sorry, dedicated resources and uh, also uh, a need to really accompany the process uh, in order that people are able to, uh, to, to, to have a good uh, view on, on the situation. Before to, to conclude, I just would like to emphasize uh, the result of uh, um, discussion in, during the Fukushima dialogue in Iwaki in August 2019. Uh, there were some concerns which have been expressed by local citizens, including fishermen. In fact, the scientific information provided by the expert is generally not challenged. 
that people recognize the quality of scientific information. There is a concern about false rumor for some stakeholders. There is a need to disseminate and share accurate information. But then there are also various points of view which have been expressed on the issue of offshore releases. There is a main concern on the preservation of the marine environment. There is a remaining anxiety on the product coming from the Fukushima prefecture. There is a reluctance to accept an additional pollution of the marine environment and product. And then it's referred to the discussion we had previously on what is the comparison between normal situation and post-accident situation. And of course, there is clearly a need to consider carefully this situation. And of course, there is some key concern on additional constraint on the economic activity of fishery. The way forward, which have been identified by these people, uh, was to say that there is a need to rely on open dialogue to reach compromise between the opposite views. It's not only an issue to be addressed between Fukushima Prefecture Authority and ex but, uh, expert and fishermen, but there is a need to embark all concerned stakeholders at local and national level, and we can say also at international level. There is importance, an, an importance to engage transparent and open dialogue and to have a stepwise process respecting the dignity of all stakeholders. And the dialogue need to address the perspective for the future with due consideration to many factors, such as scientific, ethical, economic, environmental, societal, and, and cultural. To conclude, I just would like to advertise that the next Fukushima Dialogue, organized by Fukushima uh, NPO, Fukushima Dialogue NPO, will be organized uh, next month on 28 uh, November. Uh, with uh, so you can see here the the the, the time schedule, but it's uh, Japanese time. So take care uh, about that. Uh, and if you are interested to follow. Uh, this dialogue, which would be focused on sharing about the issue of Alps treated water in Fukushima Daiichi and PP, you can uh, register to this uh, dialogue and follow it online. Some English translation uh, will be uh, provided. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Thierry. Um, we have time for just uh, one question. Um, Thierry, um, there is a question from the audience. Um, so you discussed the publication um, uh, 146, and we talk mostly of human protection, but um, uh, there is an issue that is invoked a more, yeah, a more general sense of um, environmental protection. Um, and um, the I ICRP has been thinking more on this, or on this more general sense of environmental protection. Um, in recent years, and could you maybe consider this discharge in reference to uh, publication 124? Yeah, in fact, with, with regard to environmental protection, you can find in uh, publication 146 few chap few paragraph or section dedicated to, to this issue. To be honest, uh, clearly, uh, currently, if we compare to the DCRL, the, the derived uh, reference concentration level, uh, this is not too much at stake, except in few situations. So in most of the case, this uh, DCRL will not help to clearly address uh, the environmental protection in a broader sense. Currently, uh, ICRP, and you, you may know that uh, there is uh, yesterday and today uh, uh, ICRP uh, digital workshop uh, discussing uh, the future of uh, uh, the recommendation. And one of the topics which have been uh, mentioned is to think about uh, protection of the environment in the perspective of ecosystem service. And this is something uh, to be better considered uh, which have not been uh, investigated so much by ICRP up to now. We just mentioned that within the optimization process, you need to consider uh, economic, environmental, and societal factors. But in practice, what does it mean? This is clearly uh, an issue uh, which is a challenge for ICRP in, in the following years. Thank you. Um, next up is SB Brown. He's a representative of SAFECAS, a citizen science organization initiated in the wake of uh, the Fukushima nuclear accident. Um, SAFECAS has really grown into an international um, citizen science organization, and I'm happy that they can present here today. 
Uh, thank you very much, Yoka. I'm happy to be here as well. I'll share my screen. Is it visible? Yes. Okay, great. Yes, so uh, my title is uh, Transparency and Trust, uh, and looking at the planned ocean release from Fukushima Daiichi as an opportunity to set positive precedents in recovery governance and oversight. Uh, so I wanna point out that the key issue, um, they're not the technical or scientific ones of what will the impacts be if carried out according to plan. I think many of us agree that uh, it could be done properly and with uh, uh, adequate protections uh, of uh, human health and the environment, uh, but it has to be done properly. The main questions concern transparency and oversight. Uh, basically, how can the public have confidence in the official information used to state that all is well? Uh, some aspects of importance is, well, one is that this is actually a very large release. It's not as large as some that we heard about from uh, La Hague and others, Sellafield, but it is currently uh, over 860 terabecquerels, and we should assume that it will exceed uh, a petabecquerel. And of course, the amount of water will continue to collect uh, over the course of the releases. So this is actually a very, very large release. It's a very high profile internationally. It's very contentious. Uh, this will set an important and enduring precedent regarding international responsibility. And I'll address that a bit more later. It's been politically weaponized that is being used by some countries to attack Japan, even through some sorts of distortion sometimes. And it's also the subject of a lot of disinformation. We're still hearing uh, claims that it will cause the extinction uh, of the ocean. Uh, it's an emergency action. I don't think there's anything normal about it. So I don't think it should be justified by normal precedent. I mean, we can point out that the concentrations, if the releases are successfully uh, controlled, as planned uh, will be in line with others. But in fact, the entire process, the decision making, the reason that it has to happen, none of it's normal at all. And also this will continue for 30 years or more. Um, I would like to state the goal, the overall goal as uh, making a responsible, inclusive, transparent, nationally and internationally supported process, which safeguards human health and the marine ecosystem over the long term, increases public confidence and can counter disinformation and politically motivated distortion. This may sound like a lot, but I think most of the people uh, today, uh, you know, presenting on the panel probably would agree with this. Uh, one pressing question, which I do not think has been addressed, is, is this a transboundary release? Uh, in fact, uh, I would say Deputy uh, Director General uh, Everard was actually asked directly by a journalist from the London Times at the press conference on September 9th this question, and she responded in terms of priorities of uh, transparency, etc., uh, but didn't answer the question. So the journalist repeated the question, and she still did not respond. Uh, we have heard some uh, commentary that this would require a request from a member state to make this determination, but that may not, in fact, be the be the, the the, the fact we should uh, pay, you know, probably have the, ask the IE Office of Legal Counsel to advise the DG, and the DG should state uh, the opinion and rationale. Uh, the point being that existing treaties specify needs for early notification, international consultation, etc. This is basically the, you know, uh, the rules-based system, and I think we need to maintain that. It's incredibly important to maintain it. Uh, one related question is, do the existing water discharge proposals set a precedent that the international community is happy to accept? In other words, would we accept this uh, if it were similar releases, a similar uh, decision making process uh, by the Russian Federation into the Arctic Ocean or by France into the Mediterranean, by the UAE into the Persian Gulf or by any uh, nuclear power state into any uh, body of water? Uh, basically, again, I'm talking about the decision making process, uh, the transparency, information provided, etc. Uh, another question uh, is within Japan, what would trigger a stop order by the NRA? In other words, uh, you know, we, we talk about, uh, you know, basic conditions, assuming that it will be acceptable. Uh, they, we understand if certain limits are exceeded that, um, you know, it will be shut off temporarily. But what if there were larger problems? organizational or governance problems, what would uh, it take for the NRA to say, TEPCO must stop this, we need to come up with a new plan. We haven't heard anything about that, and we need to know what data would be used for this and how it would be obtained. Similarly, I would ask the IAEA, uh, you know, what would they consider to be grounds to uh, request cessation or to say that things are not going uh, according to plan? 
And uh, actually, uh, if, if uh, Ms. Tanabe could answer about uh, the Japanese uh, government policy, that would be helpful. And perhaps Christoph would like to answer about the transboundary release aspect and this aspect as well, if he has time. Um, in terms of stakeholders, yes, I think we all agree stakeholders need to be in included. They include, obviously, the marine product producers, the fishermen uh, you know, associations, the residents of Japan, and not just local ones, uh, the scientific community as a whole, uh, neighboring nations, the international community, uh, and several major stakeholders continue to oppose the decision, primarily the fisheries cooperatives, and it was basically made over their strong objections. Um, how can stakeholders be included in the decision making process, uh, rather than not being uh, given explanations after the fact, uh, and invitations to observe are really not enough, they should be included in the governance. Um, Another question is, what does an inclusive, trustworthy, and transparent reassurance monitoring program look like? Uh, we think the situation calls for an inclusive monitoring structure. We've heard uh, the need from Jordi about uh, having as many researchers uh, invited to participate as possible. Uh, we think it needs to be robust and open, uh, international, with a lot of third-party participation, uh, including, again, independent researchers, as well as citizen scientists. Uh, the TEPCO report of August 25th, uh, which we know is based on uh, Japanese government guidelines promises measurement and confirmation by third parties, but it doesn't say who will be included or on one, what basis, who will qualify. Uh, also promises observation by local agricultural, forestry and fishery producers and local government officials, but we think the participation should uh, explicitly include citizens, environmental groups, as well as independent researchers. Uh, I want to point out that there was a recent IAEA interlaboratory comparisons report, which included quite a few uh, ocean uh, laboratories in Japan, and we think that that was a very positive step that could, in fact, uh, have some benefit for this process. Uh, regarding citizen science, the experience of SafeCast, uh, and we've been doing this since 2011, is that participation and measurement is essential to building real trust in data and creating informed citizens. This is very much uh, along the lines of what Thierry referred to uh, about citizen vigilance. They need to learn how to do this themselves and to speak uh, about it uh, in an informed way. There are excellent precedents for uh, citizen science-based ocean monitoring of ocean radiation. Uh, one includes ACRO, which is a French uh, or citizen science organization that's been included in monitoring of releases from La Hague uh, and actually has played a very good role there. Another is the Our Radioactive Ocean uh, project from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and the University of Victoria in British Columbia, Canada, which has been monitoring uh, for Fukushima ocean releases on the North American Pacific coast. Uh, there's lots of competence available and we think they should be included. Um, by way of conclusion, I would say, what are the best precedents to set? Uh, and we really think that this has been done too unilaterally by Japan, uh, that much of, of the consultation that we would expect to have happened before the decision actually did not happen and is now only beginning to happen. Uh, and we need to stress that this kind of action would be met with strong international opposition and actual consequences. Uh, second is, what are the best practices in this case regarding transparency and stakeholder engagement? And again, we'll say, and open decision-making process and governance that includes all stakeholders, uh, I would say it should be in the spirit of the RS Convention. Uh, and also we need robust and open third-party verification. How can we achieve that? Uh, it's important that advisory bodies and international partners state these expectations clearly, outline the processes by which progress will be evaluated and made public and follow through. Uh, finally, I will just say uh, SafeCast has published quite a lot of analyses and comments regarding this issue. Uh, we've been following it very closely since the beginning. Uh, in May, we published a special report, No Trust Without Transparency, uh, which has very detailed analyses of issues, technical issues, transparency issues, issues of trust uh, regarding TEPCO, uh, some of the legal issues of terms of, in terms of international agreements, et cetera. Uh, and I encourage everyone to read that. Uh, we also published a, a detailed two-part analyses, uh, technical analysis, uh, in June uh, 2018 online at our blog, and I welcome people to read that as well. Uh, and that uh, brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Asby, um, for this very clear and yeah, um, interesting presentation. Um, is it okay if I pick up on your questions um, to, I think, um, 
the Tanabe san and to um, Christoph, I think it was. Um, I mean, uh, for for Christoph, it regarded, regarded uh, is it a tra trans boundary release or not? And will that determination be made? Uh, mm -hmm. And also, what would the IEA consider to be yeah. grounds to say, stop, we will no longer support this, uh, this is a big problem. And for um, uh, Ms. Tanabe, I would ask, you know, what is the Japanese government policy also regarding uh, issuing an order to stop? Uh, okay, um, from the agency, I can uh, make two very yeah. clear and simple statements if you want to answer to me now or later. Uh, maybe during the discussion that, okay. that may be a bit, um, I will um, uh, ask these questions again later. Also, the questions okay. that have been asked in the chat uh, area um, to the IAEA, to Thierry, etc., will be um, asked during the discussion. Um, so for um, ASBI, um, there is another question. Um, can you explain a bit more about normal operations and why this is not normal and how this, um, does this impact uh, consulting with other countries, groups, etc.? Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the question. I see that's from Dr. Ken Bissler from the Woods Hole uh, Oceanographic Institution. I'm glad he's here. Um, Basically, as we, I think most of us understand, um, nuclear facilities uh, have a design basis that often includes uh, releases of effluent, uh, including tritium, tritiated water, and others. Uh, this is done on a design basis, you know, and usually often works as designed. Uh, the situation for Fukushima Daiichi, of course, it also released tritium while it was operating before the accident, but this uh, current process, this current need, is not part of the design basis. It's not normal operations at all. Uh, it, we've seen a series of stopgap um, issues to try to first, you know, cool, keep the reactors cooled, uh, and then there's massive influx of water underground, uh, and then how to deal with this. So this is actually a cascading series of problems, which has gotten to the point where it is untenable. And uh, I, I agree, I understand there have been many uh, recommendations or options investigated, including evaporation, including burial, including reinforced tanks that can last for, you know, uh, you know, 100 years. And it, it, it may well be that this ocean release is the least objectionable, uh, but it's not normal. Uh, even if what comes out of the pipe uh, at the end is very similar to, to what we have uh, seen in the past, it's not normal. Uh, in terms of the international community, um, although it may be difficult sometimes to expect some uh, neighboring nations to actually play a strong constructive role, um, they, I believe they needed to be consulted from the, from the beginning because it, it, although it's a big issue, uh, a big, big ocean, um, it's connected and uh, the publics of those nations are also concerned. A lot of this simply has to do with providing information, consultation, and going through uh, the process of including uh, you know, partners such as the international community. And um, can you quickly reflect upon um, yeah, whether the public is satisfied currently uh, with the impact assessments that they have received? Uh, this is a really good question um, because I, early on, and certainly prior to the decision, I was looking for impact assessments, and uh, Ms. Tanabe referred to the, the one that was based on the unstair model. Uh, there was an ocean dispersal uh, assessment released by the Japanese government. Uh, but, you know, I was really happy to hear Jordi's presentation about uh, his assessments because they were much more complete than anything that the Japanese government uh, came up with. In fact, I'm not clear that legally uh, an uh, environmental impact assessment is required in Japan in this situation, and perhaps Ms. Tanabe can answer that as well. Um, I don't think the public has seen the impact assessments. Uh, I looked for details on the unscare modeling, uh, you know, assessment they made, and I was unable to find it. And I'm really very experienced with looking for this information. So I think the public does not know about any environmental impact assessments at all, possibly because not enough have been done, uh, and what has been done has been very cursory. Okay, thank you. Um, so now I would like to uh, invite um, Professor Deborah Alton to reflect uh, upon ethics, the ethics uh, involved with um, the planned water release. Um, she is a human scientist at the Norwegian University of Life Science Sciences. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I also um, acknowledge the fact that uh, Cher has asked me to present something on the uh, the perspective from a, an ethical point of view. And I mean, this has been said already many times uh, throughout the symposium already. Um, and it's really just to repeat that and say what I'm trying to do now in this very short presentation 
is just look through the problem in the sense of um, from from an ethical point of view. So we, I mean, if I was asked the direct uh, radiological health environmental impact impacts are likely to be very low. That's not the only issue. I'm not the only one saying that. There is very complex economical, social and uh, societal impact. There are multiple stakeholders. So how can ethics help in, uh, in, in this very complex situation? Well, basically it can help with mapping the complexity. It can help with uh, supporting the need for stakeholder engagement and it can help by focusing on the legitimacy of the procedures and that's really one of the key take-home messages that I want to have from uh, this talk is that we really 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 need to think very very carefully about uh, the decision making process and making sure that it meets the uh, uh, ethical criteria. First of all if we're thinking about the complex interactions we've already mentioned a load of different uh, actors that could be impacted uh, and what would an ethical mapping of the situation look like? Well, for the first point, it's recognizing that there are different values and different stakeholders and different ethical uh, implications of uh, the situation we're dealing with. For example, well-being goes much beyond the radiological impact. It also uh, includes uh, economic consequences, and it also includes impacts on the ecosystem, which is uh, some of the things that have been um, being brought up during the chat and the discussion. How do we actually uh, deal with uh, ecosystem impacts? And if we're looking at uh, impacts on uh, autonomy and dignity, we need to think very, very carefully about issues to do with uh, choice and control, uh, the situations of people impacted by these issues, what choice, what, um, what uh, opportunities that do they have for gaining control over the situation. But it also would raise more complex ethical questions if we start thinking about ecosystem impacts, about how we value the ecosystem. And uh, that would pick up on what uh, has already been uh, talked about in terms of uh, ecosystem services, but also sustainability, which uh, wants to look at uh, both environmental, economic and societal effects of uh, ecosystem changes. Justice and fairness, this would cover both the distribution of these risks and benefits between different actors. So we'd need to look at that into very, uh, very carefully, but also um, legal implications of the uh, actions that are being carried out. So this is not something that will be carried out by uh, a ethical philosopher sitting in an ivory tower. It's something this kind of reflection on these uh, ethical challenges is something that needs to be carried out with uh, multiple stakeholders and trying to better map and better reflect on the ethical issues at state. The second area that uh, ethics helps in uh, this situation is to um, underline the reasons for why we're engaging with stakeholders. And there's a very ethical dimension to the need to engage with the stakeholders. There's the empowerment to promote control over environment and well-being. There's dem democratization, that they simply have a right to participate in decisions that would affect their lives. So we need to think about uh, which stakeholders would be impacted by uh, this situation. Of course, there's an efficiency um, uh, reason as well that they have very important uh, and relevant knowledge to contribute to the discussion and uh, the success that particularly from the public point of view, if they don't feel that they have been consulted uh, sufficiently, uh, they can actually um, halt the process. But uh, they, these are very, very, very fundamental ethical reasons for uh, including stakeholder participation in these discussions, as well as the Aarhus Convention, which um, uh, as we also mentioned as a strong legal uh, requirement for participation. So the decision-making process itself, um, this is again something that if we're wanting to sit down and very carefully evaluate what the decision process would be to meet ethical criteria needed for, uh, for, for satisfying um, a, a quality stakeholder engagement in all senses of the world. Um, and the inclusiveness to make sure that people who um, uh, should be there and should be represented and have uh, an impact on the, uh, the decision should actually be included in those decision making. There's a timing issue that needs to be continuous and flexible. Flexible. There is this particular need for independence and uh, influence um, 
it has to be some genuine impact on framing and choice of the issues uh, in place uh, and how we have to think very carefully about how participates have, participants have been included in, in that process. I'm going to come back to uh, the issues of independence and the transparency uh, in the final slide as well. But transparency is not just about how the process is conducted, but there has to be very, very honest and clear uh, indications about uh, the aims and who's going to benefit from the process. And it is not just a case of uh, um, allowing people to observe or collecting uh, uh, observations and statements from stakeholders. There has to be uh, a real involvement in the process. And then this accountability that uh, it should be mutual learning for participants and uh, any concerns should be responded to, even if we're not um, doing as uh, certain stakeholders would uh, would wish us to do, for example, uh, as Aspie said, there are, there are different perceptions on this. We still have to respond to those concerns and uh, give feedback on um, on how these things have been uh, dealt with. Okay, um, I'll finish off with uh, monitoring, which I also. Uh, pointed out as being a, a particular issue that is going to need an awful lot of attention. It's been mentioned by previous speakers as well. Uh, and of course, there's the need for monitoring to support uh, technical uh, assessments. It can also be used as a procedure of giving increased control for impacted uh, stakeholders. And this is where citizen science would come in and be uh, an example of actually giving people impacted uh, some control over the situation. But there needs to be really very, very careful consideration of uh, how these monitoring procedures would uh, meet the criteria of reliability, of transparency, not just in the, um, the measurements and the results, but transparency in, as Aspie pointed out, what happens if, uh, if uh, levels are higher than expected, for example. And the independency, again, I can't answer exactly who that will be, but that's an important thing for people to sit down and discuss what actually makes a monitoring uh, program truly independent. And that can only be answered by getting the stakeholders together and having this discussion on uh, independency. But I do agree with the statements that have been made uh, earlier that this is uh, definitely a broader scientific community and particularly scientists uh, in research institutes, in universities that could be seen to have a greater degree of independency. But we need to first have that conversation about what would actually make a monitoring um, uh, endeavor truly independent and recognized to be independent by the stakeholders uh, involved. Okay, uh, I think I'll stop now because I've seen there's absolutely loads of extremely interesting questions already in the chat, which I'd like us to have uh, the chance to go through in the discussions, but I'll finish now and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Deborah. There was also actually an interesting debate uh, or discussion going on on independency of uh, science and scientists in the discussion uh, or in, 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 the, Q, uh, in the chat. Um, but there is actually also a question for you. Um, so Deborah, in your experience, is any country following your good practice pointers on issues of uh, radiological protection? Uh, good practice for stakeholder engagement. It's something that we have been uh, focusing on specifically in uh, European projects, so that has been uh, happening. It's uh, been uh, definitely the situation uh, in Norway when we've been discussing, um, uh, uh, or I went back to uh, follow-ups from Chernobyl, we had uh, discussions with multiple stakeholders there that did try to, um, to meet those practices. Uh, yeah, so I, I think they are, but they definitely could be <laughs> addressed uh, more broadly. Okay, thank you. Um, if it's okay with you, then I'll move on to the discussion now. Um, so we've heard um, a broad range of um, yeah, different fields and different expertise on, uh, on the issue um, of the um, release of um, yeah, offshore release of um, water. Um, and as I was um, rushing to give the floor as early as possible to the presenters, I completely forgot to introduce two other panelists who will be joining us now in the discussion section. Um, 
So I would like to give the floor uh, first to Ian Darby, a representative from Safecast, and then to Yoshi Yoshida Hiroko uh, from the Japan Health Physics Society. So um, Ian Darby, could you briefly reflect uh, upon um, the, the presentations and give uh, your opinion, please? Uh, very briefly, as I recall, I've got a strict timeline and I'll be told I'll get guillotined. Uh, so good, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, very interesting sets of presentations. Um, I thought there are, there are lots of good points about it. Um, I, the, I think one of the, the key things that comes through is all the scientific and technical people who have knowledge on radiation protection largely agree that the dose con the concentrations after the ALPS processing will likely be acceptable and will likely have a negligible human health impact or the impact in the food chain. But I think you know, obviously I'm speaking from Safecast here today. I think the bigger issue relates to the last two presentations from me, uh, from Asway and from Deborah, which is, it isn't what you do, it's how you do it. Uh, and we have to have confidence in that this takes place for a long time. And I thought there were lots of different points made during the presentation, but they all come back uh, to the question of, do we, do we have confidence in the processes that are taking place and the way that the information is shared so that there's not space for doubt and fear and uh, you know, disingenuous people to get in the way of this and cause trouble. We are dealing with the, the you know, these subject matters affect huge numbers of people, their livelihood, mental health uh, in Japan following the Daiichi accident is, you know, co caused farm, you know, huge amount of more damage than the direct radiation exposure. So these are not, these are consequences that are very important. And it's not just about the specific concentration of, uh, you know, radioactivity values, it's the whole process of how we in the nuclear industry, uh, and I say it because I do work in the nuclear industry, choose to uh, deal with these issues. Uh, and I, if I can make one point before I get guillotined, that's just, uh, I'm, I'm based in Scotland at the moment and COP26 is coming up soon. You may, depending on your, your own political persuasions, but if you agree that climate change is really a big danger, then the way that we choose to handle these nuclear uh, contamination and decommissioning issues affects public acceptance to the more widespread use of nuclear power, which is actually one of the IEA's objectives. And if we don't do this well, we jeopardise everybody else's confidence that humans can handle this subject matter well. And that may well have absolutely catastrophic effects because we'll end up with not dealing with climate change properly. So I think, you know, this goes to a very large issue very quickly about how, con how we can do these things with confidence. Thank you. Um, Yoshida, um, could you please uh, unmute yourself and um, give, me, uh, give us your uh, impression of the uh, presentations of today? Okay, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so, um, so thank you for uh, uh, the introduction. I'm Hiroko Yoshida from uh, Japan Health Physics Society or JHPS. And we do research to the issues on ARPS treated water. JHPS, our society has been taken a great interest in it and working uh, uh, to cope with them. So after the government revealed their policy and uh, decision to discharge ARPS treated water into the ocean in April this year, so responding to responding to it, local fishermen and residents have voiced their distrust of TEPCO and the government and the concerns about harmful rumors and the reputational damages. And, um, and also they, are, uh, they said that uh, decision was made without uh, uh, agreement with them. And under these circumstances, JHPS held several symposiums and workshops for discussion. And the last year, international symposium was held and um, they, we explored the solution to radio the ecological protect, protection and issues on treated water. So we invited experts uh, from uh, several countries and also uh, the stakeholders, local stakeholders, including the fishermen, local activists. Uh, and then we realized uh, uh, from uh, these workshops, uh, uh, the symposium, that scientific knowledge and the scientific research data and the monitoring data are the very important. But this is just merely the bottom line even though these data are provided by the independent party. 
And uh, for instance, uh, in South Korea, the neighboring country across the sea, there have been protests against the ocean oceanic release. So South Korea tightened the important restrictions on Japanese marine products in 2013. Imports of all marine products from eight affected prefectures by the Fukushima accident were banned in South Korea. Then we um, held three workshops in collaboration with JHPS and the Korean Association for Radiation Protection, or CARP. And we are still in the middle of the discussion how to cope with the issues on out of treated water in both countries. However, um, we uh, recognize that uh, uh, that uh, Korean critics uh, emphasized that in Korea, negative images of radiation were frequently and continuously conveyed to the public. They also pointed out lack of a comprehensive strategy and the communication platform on how to communicate with the public about the radiation and its risk is a problem. And so uh, now uh, we are considering uh, to promote a discussion uh, involving uh, various stakeholders, experts, mass media, the public, uh, and, um, and etc. And also we are now considering to work together with the CARP uh, critics uh, to reduce the gap between experts and the general public and the promote understanding of radiation that it is, its risk. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now I would uh like to open up the floor to all the panelists uh, to consider questions from the audience. So we already had some um, questions from the audience and also two from ASB. Um, so I guess I will actually start with one from ASB to uh, Christoph. Um, so his question was, um, <coughs> what would uh, the IAEA consider grounds to request a cessation? I think people sometimes don't understand what uh, we are and what we can do and cannot do. And uh, I appreciate that because basically we are overestimated in our capacity of doing things. Uh, yeah, but we're just a uh, yeah, United Nations organization, technical organization. Uh, yeah, we are not a super regulator. So we have no power to authorize or no power to stop anything. And uh, yeah, yeah, I think there was a question also sometimes, sometimes in the chat, that is a chance of AA policy on uh, whatever, on, on dilution for, for waste. I mean, there, there is not an AA policy. I think people usually don't know that uh, yeah, the safety standards of the IA are reference, not because they are made by a couple of uh, your, your international civil servants, but because they are made with a very standard, robust process of consensus building of all safety authorities of the world. So when there is a change at the level of IEA publication, in fact, it's, it's a change at the level of the consensus of uh, safety authorities. So the short answer is we can do nothing because we are not interested to do that. And, uh, and, and the long answer, as I said, is and, uh, the way the agency work on safety standards, especially, is consensus-based. Okay, I see that um, Ian has raised his hand. Would you like to re uh, respond? Hi, so, hi, Christoph. So, I mean, uh, you know, I, I know we're not. I know the IEA is not a super regulator, but I think the I think the point that it wants to be made, and I'm, I'm glad that you're here for for people like me and others to make it is the so the the IEA has been very careful over the years, and it, and it must be careful as a member state organisation of criticising one of its member states. And there was some criticism of the way that Fukushima Daiichi had been handled in the Director General's large sort of volume report, but by and large the there's a perception that exists that the agency can be quite quick to step forward and provide positive endorsement for plans. But there is not a sense of how the criticism and the processes are influenced. And the agency represents 100, and, I can't remember how many it is these days, 183 member states, many of which are democracies. And the support through those countries, through to the IEA, depends in a sense that actually, as you stated in your open presentation, the IEA is a neutral player. And so when the agency's quick to be able to make clear, positive statements about proposals and policies in public, but silent on expressing concerns to the same public, there is a general perception of concern as to how the process is being influenced. And I, I, think, that, I think that is a legitimate point that does need responding to by the, by the Secretariat. Now I see that also Esri um, has raised his hand. Um, 
yeah, for I, I would probably just repeat what uh, Ian was saying that, um, yes, we we hear lots of uh, in the reports progress is made, understanding is being reached, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we rarely hear this is unacceptable. We, we consider this unacceptable uh, and we understand it's a diplomatic uh, engagement and it's difficult to, to, to be as transparent or as clear Actually, as direct. Um, Asbi, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, yeah, because we're also short on time and we have many other questions. Uh, okay, um, so, so I mean, yeah. I, 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 I can answer a couple of things. First, your perception is your perception and uh, yeah, we're not, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, not fight with perceptions. And uh, so second point is that, as I said, we are a uh, fact-based, technically-based uh, organization. And I think everybody in this panel do recognize that from uh, your health and uh, your scientific uh, your perspective, and, uh, there is no issue with the release of water. So you can criticize the agency to say the same, but we are all saying the same thing, right? And, uh, so indeed, we provide a technical assessment. We are not providing a sociological assess uh, uh, assessment, we are providing a technical assessment. And the te technical assessment is uh, 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 our mandate and, and nothing else. The third point coming to the 172 member states, as I mentioned, uh, uh, we are a member state organization and we are listening to all members. And uh, uh, as you can see on the decision which has been taken to uh, create this uh, uh, international task force, and uh, uh, the, this international task force is made with uh, uh, 11 countries, including countries of the regions and including countries which are critical of the decision. So I don't think you can, uh, we, I don't think we are siding with anyone. We are facilitating anyone and everyone uh, to be comfortable with, with the process. Okay, thank you, Christophe, uh, for your statements. Um, I will move on to the next question to uh, Thierry. Um, can you clarify uh, that those optimization principles uh, you shared are only in the context of a large nuclear accident? So not uh, in normal routine uh, operations. Yeah, as I mentioned in the chat, uh, of course, the publication 146, on which my presentation was really referring, uh, is uh, applicable to in the event of a large uh, nuclear accident. However, this question of um, optimization and all the discussion with reasonableness, tolerability of risk, this is a question which is far beyond uh, the issue of uh, nuclear accident. Uh, and clearly, uh, this issue has to be uh, addressed more in depth, uh, notably with regard to uh, where, where we are below uh, some reference level. What does it mean? Uh, is it acceptable or not? What is the meaning of acceptability? We just discussed about that. Uh, and who is judging the acceptability? Uh, and this is something which is a general uh, approach to be considered. Uh, and currently, uh, ICRP is working uh, on this topic, uh, but also some uh, other organization, international organization or national organization are, are really reflecting on that. And I'm sure that all the discussions that we have today are really relevant with regard to better addressing uh, how we judge that a situation uh, is I would not say acceptable, but uh, maybe uh, reasonable. Uh, and what is the reasonableness in all these situations? And we, we, we are confronted with different point of view, uh, and, and this is not so easy. And I'm sure that uh, the shared platform uh, will be also able to help in uh, promoting some de more inclusive decision making process. Thank you. Um, so now um, I have a question for all pa panelists. Um, so is transboundary release a recognized term and defined? Are not all effluent uh, dischargers, air, water, sooner or later, um, have some trans transboundary implications? If you would like to respond, please uh, raise your hands. Um, Jordi? <coughs> Can you please unmute yourself? Okay, am I unmuted now? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, the seas are connected. The uh, radio nucleus are released into the ocean. They first go into a local area, and then advection, dispersion, diffusion, transport means that this begins to spread all over the the system. And there is a, such thing as a global circulation of radionuclides. 
And there's nothing new about the transboundary release. The discharges from Sellafield of plutonium, technetium, and other radionuclides in the 70s, 80s, and 90s ended in, uh, in influxes of radionuclides in the waters of the Republic of Ireland. And that's what I did my PhD on. So it is, it is not a surprise. Uh, they, the, the question, however, is they may travel everywhere, but in what quantities? Because the dilution processes are very strong. And something that's released in one point in one country, uh, does another country have a claim to say that it's aff in, in affecting them when it arrives heavily diluted? And this is a, an open debate from, from two sides. One, the, the side that's been mentioned of, would we be saying the same if Russia or China was doing these releases? And the side of countries like that uh, weaponizing the issue and, and, and using it uh, in, in, in a political context. So, these, are, these I don't get into because uh, um, I'm a radiologist, but, but the ocean is a, is a very connected system and things don't stay in one place. Uh, this, is for, this is a truism. Okay, next, um, Ian, can you um, react uh, shortly? Yeah, so uh, I think the statement that was made there, uh, obviously it goes into the water and water goes elsewhere. But the, I mean, this is, if it, I mean, Jordi, it, doesn't want to deal with it, but this is effective with the political side of things. Transboundary means something. It means something in many conventions. Uh, in Europe, there's debates on the ESPO convention. So when, if, it's, if it's to be considered a transboundary, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that you might expect to take place, dialogues, uh, responsibilities, oversight, uh, mechanisms that should or should not be used. So the, the question on is, and this goes to Asby, uh, the point that was made earlier, is this is not normal. So if you're, you know, a normal discharge, do you want to kick in the whole mechanistic approach of transboundary releases? Almost certainly not. I don't think anyone would do so. But if you come back to this question of, is this normal? Is it sufficiently different? Should it be considered transboundary? And by considering it transboundary, do you turn on all of these other political diplomatic tools and mechanisms? That's a valid question, I think. Um, I also see that uh, Thierry um, wants to yeah, yeah, yeah. Briefly, I just want to to echo what uh, Ian uh, just mentioned. We we need to take into account that we are uh, not in plan exposure situation. We are after an accident, uh, and then you have to consider uh, all the element very carefully. Uh, and this is why in ICRP there is this distinction between plan exposure situation and emergency and uh, existing exposure situation. Yoshida-san, you would also like to uh, respond? Uh, yes, yes, uh, just a, a short comment. So uh, uh, in our workshops, uh, we uh, presented uh, the, uh, the results of long-term behavior of tritium activity concentration in uh, coastal regions of uh, Fukushima and uh, also North Pacific Ocean uh, since the uh, 1970s, and also the, um, the, the, the prediction uh, uh, of um, uh, after the release uh, from the, uh, the the power plant and uh, discharge to the ocean, and uh, the the results uh, uh, said that uh, the, it would not affect you know the the um, any uh, people uh, in South Korea or you know um, the, uh, in Japan you know at all. Uh, the exposure uh, those level is very very small. But uh, um, as I um, pointed out in my presentation, that is just you know scientific uh, the. Uh, the, the results and uh, the, the this is you know, just the bottom line and uh, and uh, uh, in order to to uh, to communicate with the public and uh, to to uh, reduce the gaps between uh, experts and uh, uh, the public, we have to proceed more and further. So uh, yeah, so that is uh, you know uh, the, what I want to do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Deborah. Um, do you think uh, there has been sufficient access to information in this case? So information for yeah, the public. Yeah, I, I was trying to answer some questions in chat because I didn't think we might have time. Yeah, there, there clearly has not been uh, sufficient information, but it's not just the amount of information. I mean, you can release an enormous amount. Uh, the key is to release it in a way that's uh, understandable and also relevant to um, the interested actors. So uh, yes, the technical side and giving uh, very good information on uh, expected impacts is one thing, but the information actually could uh, should uh, contain much more than that. For example, information on 
uh, on the processes and, and what is being carried out. So I agree with uh, what uh, Ken said that it's not just all about tritium and we definitely need to expand that. But I think we also need to expand it to make sure that the information is understandable and relevant. OK, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually sorry to say that we're already approaching uh, the end of almost the end of the discussion, but there is uh, time for one final question. So for each uh, panelist, um, could you respond to the following question? Um, what are we learning from the offshore release of the Fukushima Daiichi treated cooling water? I will um, follow the order of presentation. So I will start with Christoph. Yes, that's a, a difficult question because I, I, uh, the thing is not going and, uh, as, and uh, we're on something which is uh, exceptional. So I think what we're all learning is uh, uh, what can be done and, uh, on this type of situations. And from that, and we saw work from the agency, but also work from ICRP and from others, and uh, what we can learn from what we see. So the, the second thing, and I think it was rightly pointed out, that there was one part which is technical and one part which is non-technical. Uh, which is important to take into account. And I uh, just want to also mention that uh, the action plan of, uh, of Japan on the topic has one uh, part which is uh, dealing with the technical aspect, which has been presented by Tanabisa, and there is another part which is also dealing uh, with uh, support to communities. And uh, it's not something that the agency has an opinion on, but I just wanted to mention that it does exist. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Tanabisa. Thank you very much for the question. And I think the lesson we are learning is the importance of sincere communication and the importance of scientific information. Because I believe communicating with stakeholders based on scientific data in a transparent manner and timely manner is crucial for gaining understanding. And I understand there are a lot of concern and uh, challenges and so the gov government of Japan is to continue to make uh, such efforts. Thank you. Uh, okay, for me, the two things, perhaps. The first one, the most important for me is that marine uh, radiologists, uh, environmental scientists, marine scientists in general, oceanographers should collaborate together to produce independent uh, monitoring of the, 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 what's, what's coming into the, the sea and modeling of the, the impact of it. Uh, and that uh, in doing that, they have an extremely important role to make the process more transparent by providing independent corroborations of uh, those estimates that have been re released already, which is already beginning to happen. This. Um, and this could also include, uh, of course, uh, citizen science, uh, which is uh, I see is a very interesting component of, of this. And uh, probably, um, yeah, that's it. That's, that's my main message, really, so as not to complicate things. Yes. Uh, Thierry? Yes, thank you. So I, I will focus on three points. Uh, the first one we just discussed is to better characterize the normal or planned exposure situation uh, compared to post-accident situation on what is at stake behind that. The second point, uh, we, we had that discussion on uh, the quality of the environment, how to better uh, address this quality of the environment. The radiological criteria that we currently have in terms of uh, individual dose or uh, comparison with uh, uh, derived reference uh, com the DCRL for the environment are not sufficient. And there is a need to go ahead with something where we have a, dis a better evaluation of what is reasonable, what is the quality of the environment and probably some research in ecosystem service could be quite, uh, quite useful in this domain. And the third one is that we need to better address the communication and dialogue with the public, because clearly this is something where citizens need to be involved. And this is not only a matter for scientists or for regulators, but it's really uh, how to embark and to, uh, to cooperate with the public and to respond to the concern of the public in this domain. Aspi? Uh, yes, I, I think a big lesson is uh, that the public is a lot less trusting uh, than anticipated when most of our current guidelines for communication and et cetera were uh, formulated. In fact, uh, even though they're being updated constantly, they're still lagging far behind this huge deficit in trust. And this requires a much more proactive uh, planning to make sure that stakeholders are included in a real way. 
uh, to uphold their rights. And these are their rights to be part of decision making on things that affect them in the environment and elsewhere. And I don't think this has been adequately uh, recognized uh, during this process that we're seeing regarding the release of the uh, treated water from Fukushima Daiichi. Uh, Deborah? Yeah, just to finish up very quickly, um, one key thing with a, a good stakeholder engagement process is that the stakeholders themselves are allowed to frame the issues. So as a start of the pro procedure that actually that it's opened up to say what what is the issue at stake? What do we need to talk about? Uh, and that takes that much broader than just should we release or not? It can open up for discussions like um, valuing the ecosystem or or how do we design a monitoring stage? But they should be the ones setting the issue and deciding what, what needs to be talked about. And that automatically opens it up to being a more uh, decision-making pro process that respects more the needs and concerns of the stakeholders involved. So that's a tip for a good procedure. Thank you. Um, Ian? So I'm, I'll go slightly off tangent and just go, I, I'm quite hopeful. I, the, the same was true at the SafeCast 10 conference. If I just look at this, uh, the reason everyone's involved in this is actually it shows the, the wealth of care that there is for what's going on in Japan and that the people all over the world have the same kind of issues. No one's debating what's going on there out of a sense of meanness to the population of Fukushima Prefecture. Uh, if I just cast my memory back, I remember that I, I once heard a talk that part of the reason that the Fukushima Prefecture and the government of Japan wanted to engage with so much with the international community was they wanted to try and share and get some you know, out of complete tragedy, something positive to come out. <clears throat> I would say this is this is true. So many people in this room and all, all the, the research and engagement activities that have taken place over the years show that we're all learning better ways to do this based on the activities that are going on in Fukushima. So I, I don't I don't think this debate is is negative. I think this is very good and, and a sign of some healthiness that actually uh, there's, there's cause for optimism. Uh, and then finally, Yoshida-san, would you also like to react? Uh, okay, so um, just a short comment. So, uh, um, as you know, we have been facing uh, many, many issues uh, related to the Fukushima accidents uh, since uh, the accident happened. And uh, um, it's very difficult for us to answer this question because we are still in the middle of the discussion and, uh, and also you know the uh, in the middle of uh, many issues so but uh, the uh, based on the, uh, the experiences of uh, the the from uh, the workshops and the uh, symposiums that are in collaboration with uh, JHPS and the CARP Korean Associate for uh, radiation protections so uh, we are not um, we think that uh, you know uh, we have to promote further disclosure and the dissemination of information, uh, including uh, monitoring data and the scientific data, both uh, domestically and international. And uh, uh, for this, uh, uh, the, for this, uh, uh, we can use. Uh, 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 the 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 uh, cross relations between uh, the JHPs and the CARP because uh, uh, we are you know uh, the both associated societies of ARPA and uh, we have been uh, in close contact uh, uh, with each other so uh, the we already we trust each other so um, the, that is uh, you know the the uh, the it's a very uh, the good uh, uh, and important point uh, to proceed uh, to to cope with uh, these uh, um, issues uh, you know the, the together so thank you, thank you. Um, so I would like to thank all panelists and also um, the audience um, for engaging with us and engaging in this conver uh, conversation. Um, the chat has been overflowing with questions, so always nice to see. And I will make sure we can we will take up on these questions later on. Now the final word. Now for the final words, I would uh, like to invite um, Hildegarde van den Hove, the president of the Radiation Protection Platforms, MENAS. Okay. Well, thank you very much. So good morning, afternoon, evening uh, from where you're uh, participating. So I'm really happy to, uh, to have the last word uh, as chair of MENAS. MENAS, as you may know, is a consortium of radiation protection platforms of Europe. And we're uh, today, three platforms are organizing this very interesting workshop. And uh, the platform share social sciences and humanities, NERIS on emergency management and alliance on radiocology. 
And I think we can all agree that it was today a very, a very rich, um, yeah, a very rich and multidisciplinary program, very rich presentations and also discussion. So um, yeah, I, I may just like to, to just overrun now with Christophe Thierry from the IEA, Thierry, sorry, from the IEA, who, who gave an, an overview of the water issues that they are, and he mentioned that they are well managed and, and based on a comprehensive analysis. As he said, also technical, it's on radiation protection based. And that they also hope that with this talk, task force on uh, operations of discharges of water uh, that will function and where everything will be evaluated according to the international safety standards, that the international task force, which was very um, yeah, um, thought through how it was composed of, will also function as a neutral space and may answer some of the, cons the questions of concerns of, of um, transparency and so on. Then Yuko uh, Tan Tanabe also gave a clear presentation on, on the approach installed to guarantee that, and that the water that is released is, is according to all the international standards, that they also have also evoked an important monitoring program, but they also, she also sees this, uh, the, the link between this technical and, and, and the, and the non-technical, where they also want to engage better in the future, better than, than, than today, still had to engage with stakeholders and to and to communities and, and, and explain the approach which of that was that the approaches and the results which were obtained. Uh, Jordi, yeah, I can think that he represents the scientific community uh, where his, yeah, his, his conservative assessments mentioned, or let's say, re, um, uh, indicates that there is maybe not, not really a concern to men and environment, uh, but that the case leaves interesting uh, problems to be, uh, questions to be, to be answered. And um, that there is also his request to, to, to get the exact release data so that also the, the scientific community could have um, independent, but also more realistic studies. He also asked for an independent monitoring. And also this as comes back in, in almost all presentations at the clear and transparent communication. Uh, Thierry, he, um, Thierry Schneider from ICRP, um, he gave this more global appreciation of radiation protection in a rehabilitation context, important to consider. Um, and also he mentioned the, the importance of this uh, co-expertise process uh, for the involvement of the stakeholders. Um, and with respect to the, um, yeah, with this, the offshore releases, he also mentioned that the need to disseminate and share the accurate info and address also the concerns. And the concerns which are not only radiological, but also social, cultural, uh, and environmental. Then I think we came to yeah the uh, the, the presentations which were maybe maybe less technical. Uh, so we had uh, SB Brown from Safecast, where I think maybe your 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 uh, headline is no trust uh, without transparency. So he really calls for an inclusive, trustworthy, and transparent uh, reassurance monitoring program, and also the importance of citizen science among other and among other issues uh, or other important things. Deborah also on ethics. Uh, she she yeah, yeah, really stresses the complex interactions between uh, the different stakeholders, but also the different values or ethical issues um, and the, important, the importance of empowerment, of, of democratization, of efficiency when we go for this uh, stakeholder engagement, when we, when we really apply this uh, correct stakeholder engagement. And also that ethics, they can function as the glasses to evaluate the decision process. And maybe to come to that, that uh, when we, we combine uh, this, this technical, non-technical, that it was maybe a call also that if, when we face problems, that we should not only face them from starting from the radiological issues, but also starting from the issues which, which are really of concern, and that maybe our global approach would also be different. Huh? So um, I, I really hope uh, that this, this was really a very interesting workshop. So I hope that the discussions will be continued, that also the the conclusions and, and, and the discussions point will be taken forward and, and where we can as NENAS, we will certainly like, like to help. And then a last word of thanks uh, to all the people, for, yeah, maybe first all the technical people because it really worked uh, extraordinarily good for everybody. Uh, the people who attended and that were very active in the chats and in the discussions, the presenters, um, the panelists, and uh, yeah, the, the organizing platforms. I'm, I'm proud to be uh, the, the coordinator of all this. And then also Tanya Perke, Perko for yeah, sh sharing all the, the chats and also for Joke Kenes for uh, leading us completely uh, elegantly through this uh, marvelous workshop. 
I wish you all a very nice continuation of your day. Bye. Have a good day.